Bob, am I, I'm on. Okay. <laughs> Somebody's controlling it from somewhere. I thought, do I need to flip a switch? But that's our, that's our topic tonight, flipping switches, right? That's what I've been told. Um, I'm Patty Brisbane, and I am the founder of Pure Romance, and I started the Patty Brisbane Foundation in 2005. And throughout the years, I've played close attention to what women have asked about. And I provided a very safe environment for women to learn more about their bodies, about themselves, and to be able to make decisions for what happens to them in the bedroom. When I started this speaker series a little over a year ago, again, wanting to provide more of a safe environment for women and men to be able to come and ask questions. Tonight's topic is menopause. Now, I know as I've traveled throughout this room here tonight, there has been so many like comments like, you know what, I am so glad finally, finally, we have a safe place where we can come, we can hear and, and talk to fabulous physicians and we can ask questions and we can get rid of some of those myths. And I hope every single one of you who are here tonight leave feeling empowered to be able to go home, communicate more effectively with your partner and with your physician. So with that being said, we're gonna get started. We're gonna have a little bit of an icebreaker here tonight. Did you um, get some cards sitting on your seat? Okay, a pink card and a blue card, correct? Okay, we're gonna start off with a relatively easy one. What is the most important trait in a partner? Pink, intelligence. Blue, sense of humor. I'm going to tell you the majority is blue in this room, and I'd have to go along with that. Because I think I'm intelligent enough to find somebody that's intelligent and has a sense of humor, right? All right, the next one. Now, I'll let you decide the context of this one. Is it better to pink give or blue receive? Oh, we got pink and blue back. <laughs> All right, majority rules, pink. All right, let's get a little bit more on the topic. What do you think is the average age to start menopause? Is it pink between 45, 55? are blue, 55, 65. It's actually pink, 45, 65. Mm. What is the percentage of menopausal women who suffer from hot flashes? Is it pink, 50%? Are blue, 75%? <laughs> The actual statistic is blue, 75%. I knew you girls would get that one right. Speaking of hot flashes, what do you think? Are hormones safe, are mostly safe to use? Pink, yes, blue, no. Okay. We'll be talking more on that topic tonight, but the answer is yes. They're safe. Number six, true or false? True pink, um, false blue. Libido, libido issues are common in menopause. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> now, how many pills do you think the FDA has approved for female sexual dysfunction? Pink, two, or 26, blue? It's two. This is a smart audience, docs. You better be prepared. Uh, that 26 is the actual number that's out there for men. 
Are you putting out your red face emoji? All right. Finally, are menopausal women at a higher risk for depression? Pink, yes. Blue, no. Yes, pink. This is why we're, we're all here tonight, is to break through our preconceived notions of what is normal. Um, we'd like to kick this off with um, introducing our panel. So would you like to come up and join? We have Dr. Janelle Evans, who is one of our board members. She's a urogynecologist with Kettering Health, uh, Health Network. And um, Janelle, you guys can all come up. <laughs> Janelle, can you kind of share with us, what is urogynecology? Yeah, so I get that question actually a lot, even with new patients that are being referred to me. But basically, urogynecology is a really nice combination of women's sexual health, woo, <laughs> gynecology, um, and issues with the bladder. So we deal with prolapse, incontinence, and another variety of issues like pelvic pain and bladder pain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Somi Javed is a board certified OBGYN and a surgeon in her practice, Somi Javed and Associates, and the creator of the Ohio Center for Sexual Health. Um, Dr. Javed, can you share with us a little bit more what you do? Yes, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Are you guys excited? Yes. 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 Thank you, Patty, for throwing this tonight. Um, I'm a board certified OBGYN, so I practice gynecology. Um, but I really specialize in menopause and sexual health. So I deal with all the issues that women come to for um, problems in the bedroom and problems with menopause, which we will get into. Thank you. Dr. Christine Vaccaro is, uh, is the service chief of female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery division at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Whoa, that's a lot. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you do. It sounds really impressive, but basically it is a urogynecologist, just like Dr. Evans, but I, I am a military physician. Um, I practice urogynecology 99% of the time. 1% of the time I get an all-paid in inclusive vacation to Afghanistan and fun places like that. Um, <laughs> but my passion, pun intended, is female sexual dysfunction. It's so. awesome. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Leroux is a pelvic floor therapist with Oxford Physical Therapy. A lot of women aren't sure about, and I've heard it tonight as I'm moving through this room, I want to know more about the pelvic floor. What exactly do you do? Yep, so as a physical therapist, we specialize in muscle and muscle function. And as a pelvic health physical therapist, I specialize in the pelvic floor and core. So the pelvic floor is essentially muscles that are at the floor of the pelvis hence the name. So um, when those muscles become weak or tight or painful, then that's when problems arise. And so our goal is to um, improve the function of muscle, but then also to improve the quality of life through that. Are you guys sitting there going, didn't even know that existed? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Michael Krem, He's a he is a board certified in OBGYN female pelvic health and reconstructive surgery as a medical director of the Women's Health Service Line at Christ Hospital. Tell us what your day looks like. Very busy. busy. So my career started in general OBGYN and delivered many, many babies. And about 10 years ago, gave up OB and started just doing GYN and urogynecology and got board certified in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, which is the certification in urogynecology. And uh, so now I practice urogyne, general GYN, and I am in charge of the entire women's health service line at Christ Hospital. Thank you. Dr. Michael Thomas is the chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Fertility at the UC College of Medicine. Dr. Thomas is a former PBF board member and has been named one of the best doctors in America for 20 consecutive years. 
what does your day look like? <laughs> Uh, shaking lots of hands so I can continue to be named the uh, best doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I am a reef dart endocrinologist, which basically means I deal with hormones. My job every day is to deal with hormones. Half of my job is to help people get pregnant, so I have my infertility hat on, and uh, we are lucky at the University of Cincinnati to be able to do that very effectively. The other half of my day is using hormonal knowledge. Uh, to help people not get pregnant or to help them with their menopausal issues or other issues. So we have a clinical trials unit where we're developing new contraceptive agents. For example, we brought to market the Mirena and different types of uh, contraceptive hormones. We brought to market some menopausal uh, hormonal products and we're now working on a secret project. This is the first time I'll mm -hmm. talk about it publicly because it's still early in the works of taking a hormone called uh, AMH, um, uh, anti-malarian hormone, and being able to do that now in animals to try to space out the reproductive lifespan. So by not allowing your follicles to go to the next stage, you can stay 21, your ovaries can stay 21 for 10 or plus years. So that if you want to delay the reproductive lifespan for a prolonged period of time, you can women and to, and to promote women's health. Thank you. Sounds busy, right? But isn't this exciting? All right, and then we have PBF board member, which I'm really proud of this one, is Emma Schmidt. She is a certified sex therapist with Emma Schmidt and Associates Sex and Relation, Relationship Therapy. The, she's the only sex therapy group practice in the city of Cincinnati. This is another profession that is really, truly misunderstood. Um, Emma, could you, could you share with us a little bit more exactly what a sex therapist does? Yeah, so I don't have sex with you, and I don't want you to have sex. That's <laughs> top question. Um, I do talk therapy, so when you come into the room, basically I hear you and I listen and I help guide you and your partner and what I'm hearing and um, help guide you to a place where you're wanting to go. So sexual dysfunctions, desire discrepancies, um, infertility, um, wanting to spice things up, if there's a fair, anything really that has to do with um, your sexual experiences, I am here for. Well, I just want to say before we get started, because sometimes this, as you know, many of you who have set this panel, that you get so many questions and so many people that come up at the end asking you. I want to start and say thank you so much. I am so humble and so grateful to have each and every one of you serve this panel tonight and be here to answer all of these amazing questions that our audience has. So, without further ado, we're going to get real comfortable and we're going to start with Dr. Evans. Um, what is the normal process of menopause? What happens and why? Okay. So, that's a pretty complex question. Um, so, the first thing I want to say is that there's no real absolute normal of menopause. I, liken it to puberty. So like remember way back when, when we were all going through puberty and then somebody came in and they're wearing a bra all of a sudden and this guy's voice is cracking over here. And you know, so everybody goes through it at a different pace and at a different time. Um, so that's really important to get out there up front is that it's not always gonna be at age 50. That is the average. So 45 to 55 is average, but it's not always gonna be age 50. Um, what is it? So I'm going to try not to steal the thunder of, of any of our other pal panelists with this, um, but basically what menopause is, is your ovaries decide that they are kind of done, right? So function starts going down, certain hormones start going down. I'm not going to go into too much detail in hormones because we have the hormone master over here with Dr. Thomas. So, um, But certain hormones start to come down and then the ovaries kind of go into overdrive. So there are other hormones that try to pick up the slack and compensate for those hormones that have gone down. 
when that happens, then you get these wild fluctuations in hormones. So during your normal menstrual cycle, you get these nice little hills and valleys, right? During menopause, you get these big fluctuations. And then that causes all of the different symptoms that we think about that are associated with menopause so much. So things like hot flashes, which is almost ubiquitous, right? I mean, almost everybody gets hot flashes. Um, some, it's usually about five years worth, but almost everybody gets them. Some people get decreased libido, some people get depression, some people um, get pain with intercourse. Um, there's a large variety of things. And we're gonna be talking about all of those different topics tonight. Dr. Javed, what is the most common menopause-related complaints that you hear in your audience or in your business with your patients? So um, I have a private practice up in um, Cincinnati and um, it's head to toe. So there's no most common complaint. Uh, people complain about mood changes. They feel more anxious, so they feel more depressed, like you had uh, mentioned. So head to toe, they complain about memory loss, so kind of like pregnancy brain. Um, they complain about weight gain. Obviously, their menstrual cycle is gone or diminished, and that's the definition of menopause, you know, 12 consecutive months with no period, because everyone says, well, how am I menopausal or postmenopausal, Dr. Javade? Um, and you have to watch your cycle. Um, they complain about weight gain, especially in areas where they never gained weight before. So that middle age spread, you know, hormones can lay down weight where we actually did not want it. Um, they complain about decreased sleep. They're not sleeping, obviously hot flashes. And then the sexual complaints are numerous. So problems with orgasm, problems with sex drive, problems with sexual pain. Um, their vaginas feel very, very dry. Um, so head to toe um, complaints that they have when they come in for menopause. Those of you who haven't started into this, you've got a lot to look forward to, right? <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who have say, Whew, I'm glad I feel I'm normal. Don't wish away your period. That's what I tell everybody. <laughs> uh, Dr. Javade, I know that you're involved in uh, uh, advocating for women and more pharmaceutical options, struggling with libido and desire. Can you share with us any new advances? Yes, I'm so excited. So I was one of two doctors that got invited out to the FDA. Um, these are the guys who decide, you know, the 26 to 2. Um, and I will tell you, in October of 2015, it was 26 to 0. We had no drugs for women. And I was like, well, that's great, but who are all these men having sex with? Because my patients need their medication, too. Um, so in October of 2015, we had one medication. Um, and then just June 21st of this year, we have a new medication. It's indicated for HSDD, which is low libido. Um, and it's going to be the first on-demand ever. So this is huge news. You guys are hearing this first. Actually, I did an interview with Sheila Gray on Friday, and she was like, why haven't I heard about this? And I was like, because you didn't interview me yet. <laughs> so, um, but you guys are hearing about it. It's not even on the market yet. It hits the market in September. Um, I actually am a key opinion leader, so I'm going to be speaking for and teaching other physicians about it. But on-demand, so you know how guys get to take Viagra or, you know, Levitra or Cialis on-demand, the other medication that was FDA approved in 2015, you have to take nightly, which is a great medication. I love it. I have tons of patients on it um, involved in some clinical research with that drug. Um, but this new drug is truly going to be, you can take it right before, about 30 to 45 minutes before you want to have intercourse. Um, and it works on neuroreceptors in the brain to basically increase excitation, so all the things that say yes, 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 and decrease inhibition. So all the things that say I'm too tired or mercy sex or keeping the peace sex or, you know, I don't want him to be mad at me sex. Um, so um, it works on that. <laughs> Um, it's going to be an injectable, um, so patients are kind of worried about that, but it's an auto-injector, which means you do it yourself, so, you know, we'll teach you guys how to do it, and you do it at home, and um, I think it's amazing that we actually have another um, medication, so I'm super, super excited about it, so. All right. Dr. Vaccaro, what is vaginal prolapse, and can you share your perspective on why it happens, and some preventative, is there any preventative measures that women can take to avoid this? Yes, so um, vaginal prolapse doesn't sound very sexy, okay, and a lot of women feel very um, upset, and their body image is a little crushed sometimes when they have it, and we have these validated questionnaires looking at 
prolapse symptoms, and again, if you don't know what prolapse is, it's a vaginal bulge, so feeling something protruding through the vagina, which can be the bladder, the uterus, or the rectum, usually. And if you don't have a uterus, the top of the vagina. So that's what it is. Um, and again, it can cause a lot of body image distress um, symptoms, a lot of bulge and discomfort. Um, so to answer the question of what you can do to prevent it, well, um, Pregnancy is one of the biggest risk factors and vaginal delivery, though at the age of menopause, um, C-section versus vaginal delivery, there's not a huge benefit. There still is a little bit of benefit from a C-section, but I wouldn't want you to rush out and get major surgery, and a lot of women here aren't in the prime of getting pregnant right now anyway, but having pregnancy in general is a big risk factor. And then other things that increase in intra-abdominal forces, so um, a lot of coughing, chronic asthma, smoking that causes chronic coughing, and then constipation with straining. So we really want to avoid straining, which is basically pushing down on the pelvic floor. Um, and then you'll hear about pelvic floor physical therapy, which doing kegels and pelvic floor training. So when you learn how to lift properly, squeezing and lifting the pelvic floor, which supports the pelvic organs, really will help prevent worsening of prolapse if you should develop it. But it is treatable. And I love to do surgery too. Awesome. Very treatable. Okay. Um, what about women who are experiencing pain with it sucks? Right. Um, is, there, is there any treatments available for that? The good news is, again, myriads of treatments for dryness that is associated with um, the genital urinary symptom of menopause. So decrease in estrogen um, creates the vaginal dryness, and it can happen even a few years after the last menstrual cycle. Um, so sometimes you think, oh, great, I made it through, and my vagina feels great. And then the dryness happens, so it can happen a little bit after that as well. Um, but there are non-hormonal treatments like lubricants and moisturizers that are over the counter. And then there's hormonal treatments in a variety of different types. So it's kind of like whatever flavor you want. So there's an oral pill called a, sel a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So if you don't like to do a lot of stuff down there, you can take an oral pill. There's a tablet that you can insert, there's creams that you can apply, there's rings that just act all the time. So it's kind of whatever suits you. Um, but there's lubricants, moisturizers, and if that doesn't work, then there's prescription medication. You heard that, girls. Lubricants. Lubricants. You don't have to have yeah. anything wrong with you to use a lubricant. Lubricants are first line. Makes it so much more pleasant, trust me. And a lot of women use an estrogen plus a lubricant because sometimes you just need a little bit more. So yeah. I used to say, just put it on there. Yeah, yeah. Him and her. Put it on him and her. It's yeah. yeah. There, there you go. Yeah. For those of you pure romance people that are in this room tonight. Um, Dr. Leroux, as a pelvic floor therapist, um, when you have people that are coming in to you with incontinence, are with pain, can you talk to us exactly like, how you're treating these patients. What, what are some of those treatments? Yeah, so like I talked a little bit about before, when you have muscles, and especially with the pelvic floor, which are literally just a group of muscles, um, they can kind of go for a range. So they can be weak, and then they can also be too tight. And so when you have weakness of the pelvic floor, which are the muscles that wrap around all your openings, so most people know of incontinence because of like you have to sit down and cough or cross your legs when you sneeze or in order to prevent any kind of leaking. And that's essentially where those muscles just aren't strong enough to fight off that force. So coughing, sneezing, laughing, lifting, all of those um, create increased interabdominal pressure. And those muscles need to be strong enough to fight off that force. So there's a lot of other techniques. So urgency is another um, kind of key issue when it comes to incontinence. And we can do a lot of tips and tricks as far as bladder retraining, timed voiding, um, a lot of other things just to educate the patient on exactly what's going on. Um, and then on the other end, you can have pelvic floor muscles that are too tight. So it can, they can be irritated, whether it's because of um, symptoms of menopause or age or pelvic surgeries. All of those things can cause those muscles to become irritated. And so what we can do is try to get them to relax. And so um, different kind of manual techniques or hands-on techniques in order to try to get those muscles to calm down or relax. We can also do different um, relaxation training, such as different diaphragmatic breathing um, and other options in order to kind of empower the patient and kind of get an idea of exactly what's going on with their body and get an idea of how to kind of
kind of help with those symptoms. Thank you. All right, Dr. Karam. A lot of women think that they don't need to continue to see a gynecologist post-menopause. Could you please speak to this? Sure. So, <clears throat> historically, um, we used to do pap smears every year, and that kind of used to be the impetus for people to come in and women to come in to see their gynecologist. But as time has changed and we understand more about pap smears and abnormal pap smears and things like that, less and less of the impetus is now pap smears. In fact, we don't do pap smears after a certain age. And in people who have not had any problems, they only get them every three years. So that led to the belief that people shouldn't come in or women shouldn't come in. But in reality, most of us who have been practicing obstetrics and gynecology for a long period of time, a lot of our patients came to us as their primary care docs. So not only did we do pap smears, but we did breast exams, we did pelvic exams, where we check your uterus, your ovaries, your vagina, all the other female pelvic organs that you have, as well as some of the other things. And as you get older, there are more screening tests that you have to go. Make sure you get your colonoscopies and your mammograms and things like that. So even though you're not getting a pap smear or you're not due for a pap smear, I think it's still very important that you come in and see your gynecologist so you can check all these other things, address any issues that you have, whether they're issues that we've just spoken about, menopause, sexual dysfunction, sexual issues or anything like that, and make sure that you keep up on all your screening, screening tests. Perfect. Dr. Thomas, we've been talking a lot about symptoms of menopause. You treat patients with hormone imbalances. Can you share with us uh, how hormones can be used to treat hot flashes? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me here and, and to let you all know, you know, listening to and sitting with these uh, very learned people. I, I thought, I wish they all worked at the University of Cincinnati uh, because uh, they are uh, the best of the best. And, uh, and one of the things that I've noticed, the pelvic floor people are like magicians. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people who, you know, when women used to have the doctors would tell them it's all in your head, these people will make sure that it's not all in their head. They find a way to make sure that the pain and problems that they have uh, can be resolved at some point. Uh, hormones are, um, uh, are, have gotten a bad rap. The Women's Health, Health Initiative, uh, when it came out uh, back in the early 2000s, you know, sort of scared people away from the use in menopause and doctors stopped writing prescriptions, internists think uh, that you're trying to poison your patient if you give them a prescription for hormones, but that's not the case. Uh, there were a lot of positive things, and hormones can have a direct effect because hot flashes start in the brain, and if you can, and there are estrogen receptors in the brain and the skin and a number of parts of your bodies. Estrogens uh, and hormones in general are not for everyone, uh, but for those people who are having hot flashes, particularly hot flashes that aren't being taken care of with over-the-counter remedies or other things, you should consider things like hormones. And there, there are things other than estrogens uh, that are out there to help with hot flashes. Dr. Uh, Javed uh, is a great uh, practitioner uh, who uses not only just estrogens to help with patients with those types of problems, uh, but there are a number of things other than estrogens to help with hormones. And if you use an estrogen, you have a uterus, you also need a progesterone agent. Uh, but estrogens are still used. You probably, if you've been in the menopause for more than five years or so, you probably shouldn't start estrogens anew. But if you're premenopausal or just going into the menopause uh, with hot flash symptoms, estrogens or even things like SSRIs, which are used for uh, depression, also help with uh, hot flash symptoms as well. So you don't always need estrogens. Again, bad rap because of the potential for breast cancer, but the potential for women who are or are not on uh, progesterone and estrogen together, uh, the benefits of estrogen are there, but again, it's not for everyone. Okay, let, let me ask, so we're clear. Um, is there, who is not a candidate for hormones? Well, uh, I think the, the primary contraindications are people who've had uh, current blood clots or history of blood clots, uh, patient who, patients who can't tolerate uh, hormones in general, uh, patients who have MIs or strokes, either history of or active, uh, patients who um, have had uh, uh, cancers of the uterus, particularly endometrial cancers or the lining of the uterus. Uh, but to be honest with you, there aren't a lot of people who can't take hormones. There may be a couple of other 
uh, types of people or, or people who have cardiovascular problems. Uh, but the number of people who can't take hormones are very, very low, uh, very, very small as far as the fraction of the number of people who can. Most people don't. And those are the people who try to suffer through some of the symptoms, just taking short amounts, the lowest possible dose of hormones for the shortest amount of time is sort of the mantra right now. I've had people who've been on hormones for, you know, a prolonged period of time, sometimes uh, greater than 10 years, and they're doing well. They don't have wrinkles. Uh, they are, uh, that's one of the biggest and best thing that people say that they, because they're estrogens in the skin. You know, one of the tests that people always talk about is, you know, that test where you kind of pinch the skin on the back of your hand and if it takes a while to come back down, uh, that's usually the fact that you usually, you're losing some elasticity and the collagen in your skin is uh, 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 stimulated by hormones. So hormones have their place. Again, it's not for everyone, uh, but for those people in who you and your clinician uh, uh, feel that it's appropriate, uh, you should talk to them about the possibility of uh, the use of hormones. But there are other options other than hormones these days that can be helpful. You ducks are going to be really busy tomorrow. They're all going to be signing up for this. Right, Dr. Javade's name. <laughs> all right. Speaking of that, Dr. Javade, are there more uh, natural or non-hormonal remedies um, that you can recommend? Oh, absolutely. Um, I always recommend talking to your physician first to make sure that you're a candidate. But there are absolutely non-hormonal regimens. You know, Dr. Thomas alluded to a lot of hormones that are out there. Um, but for example, there's a medication called Brazil. I prescribed it twice today. Uh, women had no idea that there is an FDA-approved insurance-covered medication that will cover hot flashes. Um, there are medications that will help you with vaginal dryness that do have a small amount of hormone in it, but so little gets into your bloodstream that as long as you talk to the oncologist, they're okay with that. There's vaginal moisturizers, there's um, lubricants like we talked about. And then there are supplements. Um, there's a new company called Bonafide, and they have medication for PMS and hot flashes and vaginal dryness. Um, I talked to my husband, who is an oncologist. You know, there is some you know flower extract, so you still have to be careful. Just because you can buy something on Amazon or Walgreens or at Kroger, you still have to be careful because an estrogen is an estrogen, whether it's prescribed to you or sold to you or you know you get it on Amazon. Um, so you have have to be you have to be careful but there are absolute um, other um, non-traditional or non-hormonal ways to treat a multitude of symptoms for um, menopause thank you all right here we go you guys buckle up because we're gonna get serious now um, so there are vaginal lasers and right now, I'm going to give three of you an opportunity to talk about these lasers. Uh, and I want, to hear your, I want to hear different perspectives, because I know that each every one of you have different perspectives on this. So let's start. Dr. Cram. So I think you're talking about the Mona Lisa laser. There are all sorts of lasers, and we've used lasers in medicine and surgery for a long period of time. Um, most of the lasers historically have been used externally. Dermatologists use a lot of lasers and uh, some of the other external diseases that we'll see or conditions that we'll see are sometimes treated by lasers. So when we're talking about hormone replacement therapy, we're talking about menopausal symptoms and what we call genitourinary atrophy of the menopause. And what that basically means is when women go through the menopause, as it's been alluded to before, they stop producing estrogen. And there's estrogen receptors all over your body. One of the areas that are very concentrated in these receptors are the lower urinary tract, which is part of your bladder and your urethra, and then the vagina. And so when you take estrogen away from that, over time, then you start to see changes. And those are the changes that you see with menopausal atrophy, the thinning of the lining, the non-stretchability, there's no laxity, there's no lubrication. And that leads to the symptoms of pain with intercourse. So historically, and to this day, the standard of care, if you want to use that term, I don't like to use that term, is to use an estrogen product, whether it's oral or whether it's cream. But there are some women, as Michael uh, alluded to, that can't take estrogen. 
if you've had a history of breast cancer and it's estrogen receptor positive, most oncologists will tell you not to use any estrogen. Even if you use a little bit, even if you just don't even get absorbed into their system, if they go to their oncologist, most oncologists will tell you don't use estrogen. So that population does not have a treatment, so to speak, other than the over-the-counter lubricants and things like that. So one of the lasers that we use now is called a fractional carbon dioxide laser. And again, it was used in dermatology, and they started to think, well, in, and these are the researchers in Italy is where this started, and they said, why can't we see if we can use this laser to get the same stimulatory effects in the vagina that we got in the skin? And so they tried it, and it did work. So women who have, it's called the Mona Lisa Touch laser, it's a fractional CO2 carbon dioxide laser, and you treat the lining of the vagina, it's a very simple treatment, and over time, the lining will thicken up, it will get to what we would consider premenopausal state, which means the vascularity increases, the lubrication increases, the stretchability increases, the cells that cause that change of what we call fibroblasts, these are new cells that are generating new tissue, that's how it works, and so we are now using this laser in women under those circumstances. Breast cancer that can't use estrogen, people who have contraindications for the estrogen, or people who have used estrogen or any other products and are just not satisfied with the results. I mean, you don't have to have a contraindication. You say, you know what, it's too messy, it doesn't work, I don't like it, my husband doesn't like it, and so we are using it and we're getting very, very good results. Awesome. All right, Dr. Evans. I mean, I want to echo what Dr. Cram said because it is a really fantastic new technology. I mean, new being several years old, but that's still new with medicine, right? Um, so my input on it is that when I was first presented with the initial data on the Mona Lisa, which we have in our office, um, I was actually called up by Dr. Cram's brother, who was my old boss. And he Small said... Small world, right? <laughs> He said, I have this amazing new thing. Here's a video that I made. Tell me what you think. Do you want to try it? I can get it for you for half off. Yeah, <laughs> of course, that was like the kicker. Like, I can get it for you half off. The Italians will sell it to you. Yeah, so, um, so I watched his video. And here was one of the main things that I thought about it when I, when I watched his little presentation. It was like a four minute video. Um, and it actually, strangely enough, my office manager at the time, her daughter was the patient that was being <laughs> interviewed. So, speaking of small worlds. Um, I've never seen Mickey so excited about anything in my entire life. He's generally, I mean, he loves new technology and everything, but he isn't the person who's going to do it first. You know, so when I saw how excited he was about it, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, we'll give it a whirl. We'll see, we'll see what it is. Um, the wonderful thing about it, so like Dr. Kern was saying, there is great technology. We don't quite understand why it works the way it works. Um, there's, that's still you know, work in progress. But what it does is, and this sounds terrible, but trust me, it's not painful. It takes five minutes. You can walk right out of the office. You don't need a ride, anything like that. Um, the laser is applied to the entire wall of the vagina, and it makes these tiny little areas of micro damage. So kind of like a little pinpoint burn, right? And goes all the way from the very top of the vagina all the way out to the, the introitus or the opening of the vagina. And then what that does, like Dr. Karan was saying, is it stimulates all those cells to come in and act. And we don't know why it looks like it's premenopausal after all the treatments are done, but it does. And 90% of our patients get really good results from it. Um, another application that is being researched currently is using the lasers for um, external dermatology issues. Um, so about 8 to 10% of women after menopause and sometimes before menopause as well get um, this uh, cluster of dermatologic issues um, that fall under a lichen category, which sounds terrible. It's not like lichen on rocks, right? Um, but basically what it is, it's the thickening of the tissue that's probably related to an autoimmune disease, and it causes a lot of scarring. 
and that scarring makes everything extraordinarily painful, sometimes weepy. You can't have sex at all because it's just super uncomfortable. Um, and the laser actually, while we don't have 100% wonderful data on it yet, it has improved anecdotally the lives of so many of my patients that they've tried the steroid creams, they've tried estrogen, they've tried just about anything they could think of, sometimes even surgery, and that was the only thing that actually helped them. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of the lasers that have the data. And I'm gonna say the lasers that have the data because are, there are some that don't have the same kind of data as the ones that the people on this panel use. Well, Dr. Jabeg, let's yeah. talk. Let's talk. So I have a CO2 laser as well, um, just a different brand name, but the technology is very similar. Um, it's called the Intima. Um, they asked me five years ago to be a key opinion leader, so basically I'm doing two clinical research trials in my office right now to give the FDA more data. So that's what we need for women so we can push ahead so we don't continue to have scores like 26 to 2. Um, and we currently have um, data that we're going to present about lichen and how much it's improved uh, women's lives. Basically, I had a patient who wasn't having any intercourse, wasn't horseback riding, and after a couple treatments with the laser, she's now back to having sex again. She's back to um, riding her horses again, which was astronomical for her. And so I've treated over 2,500 patients, so I've got a lot of experience with the laser. We're using both the internal handpiece and the external handpiece. Um, and when I decided to join the company and talk to them, I said, you know, we're going to break up if you tell me that I'm going to become Cincinnati's vaginal rejuvenation doctor because I hate that terminology and it implies that an 80 year old's going to walk out with a 20 year old vagina. And listen, hey, I'm great at what I do, but I'm not a magician, right? You're not going to walk out with your vagina minus 60 years. It's just not going to happen. And so even though the tissue looks better and you have folds and it looks better and it's pinker, um, we have to have realistic expectations. And so I tell my patients it helps with GSM, which is genital urinary symptoms of menopause. So we see improvement with prolapse and incontinence and vaginal dryness and sexual pain. Um, and I was just at a conference um, where they talked about, you know, women who had the laser alone or some of the vaginal medications we talked about um, or nothing. And the women that did the best are actually women that used a pill in the vagina called Intrarosa and then also the laser. And their scores were much better, their sexual satisfaction was higher. So it's very interesting. Um, and when you think about lubricants, which are amazing, and I think they work great in conjunction, but they sit on top, right? They're not gonna actually change the anatomy like Dr. Cram alluded to and Dr. Evans alluded to. So you're actually changing the building blocks of the vagina and um, it's, it's huge and patients are thrilled with the results and like I said, we are involved in you know, two clinical trials right now and it's been so satisfying to see these patients and their lives change. Yeah. Can I have one little thing? Yeah, absolutely. All right, downfall of the laser. It is not covered by insurance. That's so. one of my next questions. <laughs> Tell yeah. them. So here's, here's the problem. So the insurance companies have not even given the therapy a billing code, right? So if you can't bill anything, then you can't bill anything, right? So never covered under insurance at this point in time. There's plenty of lobbyists that are going to Washington saying like, hey, at least like, I mean, throw us a bone, cover for half of it. There's also a very wide variety of price um, and you kind of set your own, you know, so when, when you get the laser to your office, the manufacturer comes in and says, this is what you can charge for each treatment. Um, and some people choose to go bare minimum, which is what our office did, because I wanted to be able to offer it to more people. Um, and some people don't. I mean, you go to Beverly Hills and there's people charging $1,500 a treatment, which is insane. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's across the board, but you can use your HSA and FSA. So, if you have one of those, come on in. <laughs> Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just echo that same sentiment. It's, it's, it's a shame, but any new technology, uh, usually the FDA will label it as experimental, and that's what they label this as, it's still experimental. And so this, this research and what Dr. Javed was talking about, the more and more information and research that we can get to give the FDA so that they can say, yes, this is a recognized treatment, 
patients are being helped with this, and then hopefully then insurance companies will start covering it. Now they are starting to cover some of the lichen patients that we see, because those are very, very difficult patients, and the treatment modalities that we had prior to the laser didn't work that well. Mm -hmm. So if you can, your physician, if you have a condition like that, your physician can call the insurance company and explain to them, and you would be surprised what a they call a peer-to-peer -peer review where you talk to another physician, explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, they'll sometimes cover it. So we're seeing more and more of that starting to happen as more and more information is coming out. Or if you can enroll in a clinical trial. Right. So all of our patients that underwent three to five treatments, that was thousands of dollars worth of follow-up and laser treatments and everything that they got um, for free. And anytime we do a clinical trial, we make sure to tell the Patty Brisbane Foundation, and she helps us get it out there, and we put it on Facebook, and we get on the news. But we're always looking for patients to study, so anytime we have that. But that's a great way for patients who wouldn't be able to afford it or unfortunately wouldn't be able to put it through their HSA because sometimes they just say no. I mean, it's we're really handicapped. And I tell patients, you know, my hands are tied. We'll try. Um, but that's another great way. So always be looking for clinical trials. I mean, Dr. Thomas and, you know, Dr. Cram at Christ and um, Dr. Evans. So we're all part of, like, different groups, and usually someone is always um, involved in research. Right that's now, their Calvary UN, I was looking at their latest uh, recommendations, and right now it's still considered experimental, but the only way to get over that is to talk to these guys and have them get out as much information as possible. We don't do... Uh, that type of research at the university right now, but I think that uh, uh, as much as you can do to help promote these types of things so that women, not only now but in the future, will have these opportunities so that the experimental label can be lifted. I, I speak to a lot of women who have gone through this treatment, and I can tell you that the results of having laser has been beneficial. But it is sad, and it's a shame, because it needs, we, it, th there needs to be insurance attached to this, because there's people who cannot afford to go do that. So I'm all about it. I do have this question for you. Okay, you know, you watch the Beverly Hills Housewives and all these housewives on, you know, the, the, the crap TV, and they're all talking about having the vaginal rejuvenation. You just heard if you've got a 60 some odd year old vagina, you're not going to look like 20 when you leave there. So I'm really sad about that one. But I'm so sorry, Patty. I'm so sorry. I'm I was so sorry. signing up. Um, so let, let, what, it, what is that? I mean, when people say, it, when they talk about it, so this audience understands what does that mean? Bullshit. I mean, some of the shows, they were actually. It is, I mean, it's just a different way of phrasing it, but you know, the article that I brought to them was a woman in a bikini sitting there like this, and it was like, talk to your gyno about vaginal rejuvenation. And I was like, what does this have to do with anything? Okay. Um, so yeah, it's false advertising, it's crazy, it's making women think that they're gonna get something when they're not. And it's, it's the reason insurance companies are not covering it, because we are trivializing women's health care issues and turning them into a Kardashian issue, when truly it's a medical problem. And we are never going to be taken seriously. If we walk into the FDA and I said vaginal rejuvenation, I would have been walked out of that room. Um, and so you have to use proper, proper medical terminology. Now with girlfriends and wine, you want to talk about getting your vagina rejuvenated, I'm all for it. But in the doctor's office and we're having these medical discussions, not appropriate. And it's ridiculousness and it's good for TV. Give her a big round, all of them. I love it. Don't anybody ever say we don't get real here. We get real. I, I want to add into that just a little bit yeah. because um, so vaginal rejuvenation to me just makes me cringe. That, that phrase makes me absolutely cringe. And the reason why is because back when we were doing our training, vaginal rejuvenation did not mean a laser that was being used for a medically indicated thing. It was cosmetic. Okay, so basically there was this guy, and I'm not even going to say his name because it just, you know. Um, but he came up with this series of different treatments and labioplasties and, you know, basically almost like burning the vagina a little bit so that everything was tighter, right? So that from a 
theoretical standpoint, you have a perfect looking vagina, whatever that is. But I would like to say that there is, um, everybody should Google wall of vaginas, okay? The wall of vaginas is the best way to show that there is no such thing as a perfect normal vagina, okay? Everybody's is different, one labia is bigger than the other, all this stuff, right? Going in for vaginal rejuvenation, what it means is you're like, oh my God, I need to have my labia like perfect and tiny, and I need to have the vaginal opening smaller because it doesn't look quite right, right? And sometimes that is actually a medical issue. But if it's not a medical issue and you're only looking for cosmetics, that's what vaginal rejuvenation is. I think that it is absolutely a travesty that when these lasers came about, that both the media and some of the laser makers um, came up with the idea of adding that to the mix of vaginal rejuvenation. That is not what it is. This is a medical problem. So this is pain with intercourse. This is thinning of the vaginal lining. This is poor lubrication. It's all of that together that has nothing to do with your labia looking pretty. Love Patty, it. Patty, can I add a little bit on Oh, that? yes, you okay. can. <laughs> um, so cosmetic gynecology has, again, gotten a bad rap, as Dr. Evans has said, which um, I completely agree with both, both ladies sitting next to me. Um, but I would say vaginal rejuvenation as far as a surgical procedure. So again, if you have vaginal prolapse, things are falling out, you have a medical condition, we can fix a lot of that through surgery, sometimes with different types of lasers now, but um, there, there is a process for fixing that and making the vagina look good again, meaning normal, like supported, normally supported, where things should be. Um, and also, I'm just going to have to comment on this, the wall of the vagina, so I just want to make sure, because I, I love anatomy, okay? So the labia is actually the vulva, okay? That's the proper term, even though sometimes colloquially people will call it the vagina like the whole area, but the vulva is, is the labia, the small lips and the larger lips. And I love women that come in and they're, they say that they're frustrated the way they look, and sometimes people do have tugging and pulling and all these other functional problems with sex or with their clothing when the inner labia are too long, and we can reduce those, right. and that's a medically indicated procedure. I'm also gonna go out on a limb there. Some women also have just really bad body image related to the size of labia, and I'm okay, and I'm sure a lot of women here are okay, men too, um, to also reduce them if there's a really significant body image issue without a functional complaint. So surgically, we can fix these things, but I do also hate the term vaginal rejuvenation because it certainly com uh, indicates the wrong thing. We, we really wanna focus on a medically indicated procedure. So what are we not gonna say anymore in our vocabulary? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, Emma, as a sex therapist, can you speak of some of the changes that men go through as they age? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot about women. Mm -hmm. um, but for men, especially as uh, they reach 50 and older, what we find is that one society tells us that we need to aspire to have youth be a part of us. And if that doesn't happen, then we're failing us and we're failing our partner. But what we find for men as they're aging is the penis is, the penis doesn't become as erect as it used to be, it might stay flaccid longer and there needs to be more stimulation so you're not getting those spontaneous erections anymore. Um, ejaculation might be a little bit more delayed or not happen. Um, the ejaculation doesn't feel as strong as it used to be when you were 20. Um, testosterone decreases, so your energy decreases, you have more symptoms that look like depression, your partner might start to feel like they're the problem because you are not able to um, achieve the type of sexual performance that you used to. So there's a lot of dynamics that start to play into it. Psychologically, right, if we think about what society says we should look like as a male and the way that we should perform, if we're not doing that, there's a lot of anxiety and depression that starts to come just from that. So how do I start to see my identity and how do I grieve that loss of the sexual component that I had that I don't have now? What do I do with that? How do I talk to my partner about that? How do we talk about it together and how do we start to do something different? But noticing that the things that you're going through are probably normal and what are those things that you're going through and that it probably has nothing to do with your partner, it's just the way that you're aging. Um, and also not everybody goes through what a lot of times when we think about men over 50, we think about erectile dysfunction, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it's about 
looking at desire differently, or um, if you're able to masturbate and get a firm erection, but you're not getting an erection with your partner, then um, we wanna look at something else because you are able to get those erections then. So there's a lot of dynamics. Um, we like to look at, I like to look at it from a biopsychosocial. So what's going on biologically? What's going on socially? What's going on cognitively? And if we can get and understand that component, then um, we're able to understand what's going on based on where you are in your age gap too. And I will tell you from my practice, Emma is so key. Um, the patients that I share with her are amazing. Uh, I'm a gynecologist, so obviously I don't treat men, but sex involves two people most of the time, right? Um, but um, Emma helps me out, and so you know sometimes I send the women themselves, um, and obviously they tell me their partner has an issue, and they're shy, and they don't want to discuss it. Um, and then the nice thing is that Emma can see both of them together, and then she can make sure that the partner gets to the right doctor or whatever they need, because I always tell them, I can prescribe the medication, I can do the laser, um, but I can't give you the whole picture. And that's why Emma and I are part of this Ohio Center for Sexual Health, because it's a mind-body connection. So it's everything. It's counseling, it's medications, it's physical therapy. It's, there's so many pieces to sexual health and making sure that both partners are involved. If I give her Addy or Vilesi in the future and increase her libido, but her husband can't have a normal erection, then I haven't fixed the issue. And I've done a disservice to both parties involved. And then in fact, he's gonna feel um, more you know, ashamed of himself or feeling like he's not you know, doing what he needs to do. And that's where Emma's group has been um, instrumental to our practice and absolutely amazing. So thank you for what you do. I love all the love in this room. <laughs> All right, Dr. Evans, I mentioned earlier that there are cancer survivors in this room. Can you give us a little more insight and education about medically induced menopause and some of the more specific challenges that that brings? Okay. Yeah, so onco oncologic related menopause, whether it just exacerbated it a little bit or caused it, um, huge topic, massive topic. We could spend three hours on stage just for that one alone. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna kind of go through the different general things that can happen. I know you ask about medical, but I wanna talk a little bit about surgical too. It's okay. So when people are diagnosed with gynecologic cancers, um, a lot of the times, especially if it's ovarian, uterine, sometimes cervical, you're taking the ovaries out as well. And that can happen from an age anywhere in your 20s to whenever, right? Um, menopause is meant to be a gradual process. Um, when you take the ovaries out right at the time of surgery, the menopausal process is a lot more extreme afterwards. And I feel like a lot of people aren't being counseled that way. And sometimes it's just because we don't have the data. Like people haven't really done the best research on what is it like to have surgical menopause? What's the emotional toll? What's the physical toll? And how do we prevent that from being such a damaging thing to somebody? Um, so that's, that's one thing. Medically, so when we're dealing with um, patients that either actively had cancer or have just survived cancer, um, you have to think about all the different treatment modalities that we have. So chemotherapy. There are lots and lots of chemotherapies out there, and you can have cancer at really any age. So depending on when you had cancer and what agents were used, either you can have premature ovarian failure um, or you can basically just have a lot of things at the time. So let's say you're perimenopausal, right? So you're somewhere in the, in the 40 something range. You get cancer, you get chemotherapy. That is gonna push you quicker towards menopause, okay? Because it's an insult to the cells, it's an insult to your reproductive organs. Um, the other things that chemo can do is it can severely decrease libido for a variety of different reasons. Um, and sometimes different types of chemos can either lead to neuropathy that causes a, a lot of pain with sex or the opposite, where you feel nothing anymore. Um, so that's one thing. There are some therapies that we use after your initial chemo, okay? So like for example, breast cancer therapies. So you have you know, your tamoxifens, your femaras and everything in between. And generally it's recommended to be on those for several years after your survivorship those have a mechanism that basically suppress any estrogen that you might have left. So if you are already experiencing some menopausal symptoms, you're gonna get a lot more. 
and it can be kind of miserable. And the problem with that is that we can't treat you with estrogen, right? So while you're going through that situation, it's very, very difficult to fix it right then and there because our cure-all wonderful drug is estrogen, right? So that's another problem. Um, lastly, we have radiation, okay? And radiation can do a real number on the pelvic floor. Um, so when you have, for example, cervical cancer or endometrial cancer that was not very early stage, you're going to have some sort of pelvic radiation. Pelvic radiation causes damage to fast-growing cells, and unfortunately, skin is a fairly fast-growing cell. So what the tissue looks like afterwards is very reddened, sometimes kind of taut, like it's basically just a really taut scar tissue. It can cause stenosis of the vagina or severe narrowing. Um, even the surgeries from those, those particular types of cancers can cause shortening of the vagina as well. And because the radiation is right there in the vagina, guess what's above it? The bladder. And guess what's below it? The rectum. And all of those things can be severely affected with certain doses of radiation and certain predispositions to your health. So you can get a lot of things like radiation cystitis or severe pain, um, bladder bleeding, all of that kind of stuff after radiation. I think the biggest message, and I'm not gonna go into all the treatments because there's so many different things. Right. The biggest message is that the people on the stage are, are the people that, that you need to see. And I'm not talking about like just one of us, it's everybody. Um, so we have Emma that's gonna help you through some of the emotional toll and some of the changes in your libido and everything. You know, we have Dr. Thomas who's gonna counsel you, is it okay for you to have hormones of any type? And how do we deal with this afterwards? You know, we've got Dr. Graham, Dr. Vaccaro, Dr. Javed and myself who are all, you know, 100% into the, the medical solutions behind things and also emotional as well, but Emma does the best at that. And then, <laughs> and then we have Sarah who's, I mean basically pelvic floor physical therapy is integral to fixing a lot of the pelvic pain and sexual pain that you have after cancer treatments. The one thing that brings up for patients who are of still of reproductive age, who are going to, before they go through chemotherapy, before they go through radiation, uh, we are now able to get people in. My partner, Dr. Julie Rios, who we also work through Children's Hospital, uh, can get people in within two or three days of a cancer diagnosis before they start chemotherapy so that we can get eggs or ovarian tissue so that you can have something after you get through your therapies and your treatments. Uh, those types of things weren't available and we're trying to encourage all of our uh, uh, oncologists especially and radiation therapists to, to really have someone see someone like Dr. Uh, Rios uh, before they start any therapy because if you just give us a week or two we can get the eggs out and store them for later or if you want to get we can make embryos with a, a, a partner sperm. Uh, and also that treatment, that s secret thing that we're sort of thinking about doing or are in the process of doing uh, at uh, the University of Cincinnati where you give patients this exogenous AMH. Uh, you actually, because you're not activating the, the ovaries to continue to grow and you can put those ovaries in a state of animation, the studies that have been done in animals so far have shown that if uh, you can put these people on that type of therapy, uh, which isn't available in humans yet, and then have them go through any type of chemotherapeutic agent, you get a, a consistent normal ovarian function after treatment. Again, very early experimental stages in animals right now, but we hope to be able to start human studies at some point. So there are things that are available so that when we talk about the loss of ovarian function, we're talking about potentially preserving ovarian function or right now <coughs> at least preserving ovarian tissue or eggs so that you can use those in the future. One of the things with ovarian cancer, when women are having hysterectomies, a lot of times if they're 45, 47, your doctor might say, would well, you want your ovaries removed or not, because that will take the potential of getting ovarian cancer out of the picture. Well, in reality now, now that we know embryologically, we know that ovarian cancer actually starts in the part of the tube that sits next to the ovary, not in the ovary itself. So right now, instead of most, most gynecologists that are doing tubal ligations, instead of burning the tube or tying the tube or cutting the tubes, they're actually removing the tubes but leaving the ovaries in. 
So that's something that you might want to talk to your gynecologist about if you're ever having that issue and discussing whether you should have your ovaries or not for that reason. The second thing that's happening is we're starting to do more of this genetic testing. I don't know if any of you have gone to your gynecologist and say we can do these genetic tests now and we can test you and find risk factors for pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is new, but a lot of these new tests, there's not a lot of data to support what they're saying. But again, when we all go to our doctors and they say, well, you might have a one in 10,000 chance of developing ovarian cancer or breast cancer because you have this mutation of this gene, it scares everybody. Yeah. And they're gonna say, do what you have to do, take my ovaries. And that not, is not necessarily what you have to do. So you have to be very leery about those types of discussions. I want to take a little sidebar here. So I would like to think, uh, everyone think if we told men that at a certain age we're going to take your testicles out, right? <laughs> because you have a 1 in 70 chance of developing testicular cancer, most men would be like, no thanks, I'll keep what I got, right? But for women, for whatever reason, um, it's kind of, it has changed, um, even since I was in training, um, it has changed. When I was first in training, it was, if you're over 45, you're getting a hysterectomy, the tubes and ovaries went too. It was just like, that's what was gonna happen. And then, just like Dr. Evans mentioned, women plummeted right into surgical menopause and we didn't counsel them very well and they were miserable for several years, if not forever. And that thought process has slowly started changing because quality of life is important and the ovaries for women give a lot of hormone support. And yes, they do slowly decline, but even we have data showing up to age 65, it's still a good idea to keep your ovaries if you don't have a genetic predisposition to ovarian cancer, so breast ovarian cancer syndromes, those are the women we really want to take the ovaries out because they have a high risk of ovarian cancer. But if you're the average woman up to age 65, it's very safe to keep the ovaries in if you're going to have a hysterectomy or have some other reason to have pelvic surgery. Very important topic. Awesome. Ovaries are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> keep your ovaries, no girls. <laughs> All right. Emma, so many of these couples struggle with feeling alone during and after cancer treatment. How can a sex therapist help these couples regain intimacy? Mm -hmm. So during, I would say connect with your partner, talk to your partner, ask them how they're experiencing their treatment, and then also check in with a partner who's not going through it. One thing that I hear a lot of is the partner who's not going through cancer is scared to touch or even engage with the person who is going through treatment. They don't want to hurt them. They're, they're low in energy. They don't want to bother them. They just want to be a support. But they're also frustrated and feel alone in that process because they um, want to connect in some way and they feel like they've lost their partner in a way. But they're also trying to keep their partner alive, right? Um, the person going through it is feeling guilty because they feel like they can't provide for their partner because they have low energy, because they're in pain. And so in those moments, I would say, sometimes you just have to say, let's take sex off the table, right? No one in history has ever died from not having sex, okay? So being able to say, right now is not the time for us to engage in this sexual activity, but how can we connect? How can we feel intimate together? So intimacy is knowing and being known. So if I can connect with my partner and know them and them know me in a really emotional way, that can feel really bonding. How can we kiss or hug or snuggle during this time? Like what feels good for us and what is something where we're not completely avoiding it, but we're, um, we're asking each other what feels good based on what I'm going through right now. And then after when you're in remission, um, being able to have that conversation, you know, now that we're through that, we've survived that, we're in a process of celebration, but also grieving and in shock a bit, what do we do now? What are we needing from each other now? What do we need to rediscover, right? So being able to sit down with your partner and ask some of the hard questions of, um, what are you needing from me? What are you interested in sexually now? And you might not know. So some of it's gonna be about um, rediscovering yourself, touching yourself, figuring out what feels good, grieving some of the things that you've lost, your partner grieving some of the things that have been lost, coming together and doing what I call, well, I don't call it this, but what's called sensate focus, where you do a exploration exercise, so you're both naked, 
and you are exploring your body and getting to know your partner's body in a new way and you're, you're knowing what it feels like to be touched again. Some of your sensations are gone and so what does that feel like? How do I grieve that? What other sensations are more heightened and how do I experience that? Sex is gonna look different, sexual connection is gonna look different. But what I find is when we can sit down, have that conversation, be really vulnerable with each other and do some of those exploration exercise, we're able to bond and have a more fulfilling sexual experience together because we're able to know um, what do I like, what do you like, what feels good now and how can I express that to you so that when we are engaged, we um, have a better understanding. And this changes every season of life. And so, like my husband and I have this conversation probably every day. <laughs> because every day, my desire or what I'm feeling is different, right? The clitoris changes every day. And so being able to sit down and how, you don't have to do it every day, it just like helps us. But um, to be able to connect in that way, I think really changes and helps you be able to know that intimacy, know and be known by your partner to have a more fulfilling sex life too. Aren't you guys glad you came tonight? Yeah. <laughs> we learned something. Um, Dr. Javade, we're hearing a lot about survivorship medicine. W what is that? What is it? So to me, survivorship medicine is women who have gone through um, cancer treatment and therapy. And these women have chosen not just to survive, because that's the way I'm married to a medical oncologist who causes a lot of the problems we're talking about tonight. Um, and uh, it's not just about surviving anymore. It's about living and quality of life, right? You just don't measure now on a graph how many years you're going to live after treatment. But those women come in and say, I'm broken. I mean, think about it. Their world has been wrecked. They are tired. Their breasts may be gone. Their ovaries may be gone. Their uterus may be gone. They're, they look different. They are drier. They're tired. They don't feel well. Their self-confidence is tanked. And they were, use words to me like, I'm broken, Dr. Javade. I want to get back to normal. I want to connect with my partner. I just don't want to survive. I want to live. And how do we do that? And so survivorship medicine is providing those patients with options. like you know, the vaginal laser for dryness or for the oncologist who is open to vaginal hormones. You know, I have great discussions. I pick up the phone and, and sometimes I use my husband's name and say, hey, I'm Dr. Ferdaz's wife. And so that way they don't go like this. But, you know, that some of them are very open to vaginal hormones. Some are not. Um, you know, Brazil for hot flashes, whatever is going on, getting them into Emma, you know, talking to them about self-confidence and building them back up again to their new normal so that they can engage with their partner and they feel empowered and they no longer feel like cancer has taken control of their body but they have flipped the script and they are now empowered to be in charge of their sexual relationship and so i think it's treating a woman from head to toe all right um, Dr. Thomas, I know that there might have been people that were not in this room when you spoke about this earlier, but let, let's go back about prolonging um, the onset of menopause because we know now women are, you know, they're, they're getting into their careers and maybe they haven't met the right person. I know I've got a ton of those people in my office alone. <laughs> So who, you know, are constantly worrying about, you know, that clock ticking and ticking and ticking. And so let's go back. Let's talk about that new medication and what else can these women do? Let's yeah, like I said, the uh, AMH is still experimental. We're, it's only been done in uh, uh, rodents. We're about to try to start experiments at some point in uh, 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 primates. Uh, but AMH is a hormone that's made in the ovaries. Uh, we use it in fertility to measure in order to determine how many eggs you have left. We're doing that all the time. People are get doing these tests in the office where we're, we're measuring AMH is to basically give you a gestalt on how many eggs you have left. Uh, and what uh, some investigators have been able to do, uh, in, at, uh, particularly at the Harvard schools, is being able to take exogenous AMH and use it in a form, either giving it uh, at a intravenously or under the skin in order to stop the ovaries from making uh, or activating the egg. So by stopping that activation, you are prolonging the ability of the ovary to remain intact. 
So, because every month, you first of all, you're born with all the eggs you're going to have, ever going to have, and every month about a thousand eggs are lost every month, and that's how you get to the menopause. So that by the time you get rid of all of the eggs, you are now in the menopause because there are no eggs left. The AMH test is made in the really small follicles in the ovaries, so that AMH can tell us how many eggs you approximately have. If you are 20, it's going to be very, very high. As you get into your 30s, you slowly start to see that AMH level start to decline. We measure AMH in all of our infertility patients because it'll give us an idea of where they are, because uh, at 38, you could have a very high AMH level, but at 30, if you have a very low AMH level, it tells us there's not a lot of eggs left. But you can have a 24-year-old who has a very low AMH level, and it tells us we really have to crank up some of the hormones in order to get eggs out, in order to get them pregnant. Uh, so by preventing these ovaries from continuing to uh, activate and preventing the release of these thousand eggs, or well, the one egg that you, that you release, but it's a thousand of them that compete to become that one egg, by preventing that activation, you're prolonging the reproductive lifespan. But because of jobs, because of a number of different things, people are coming to us uh, to meet their fertility needs at later ages uh, because they've been in a professional school or because they have been in, they haven't found the right person uh, uh, in their lives to have a child with. Uh, we see people who are now in their mid-30s and 40s and sometimes a little bit older than that who want to have a child for the first time. It's obviously harder when you're over the age of 40, not impossible. Uh, our cutoff uh, to be honest with you, is around 50 because the chances of a person getting good eggs from their ovaries at that time without having a baby with uh, issues becomes problematic. Uh, but uh, uh, the best ages are anywhere between t 18 to 40 and probably out to 45 for some people. Uh, but uh, the need to have a child at a later age or just the need to sort of prolong the reproductive lifespan is there, and so we're trying to come up with ways in order to do that. Thank you. Okay, before I open this up, you guys have been the most awesome panel of doctors. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here tonight, but I'm gonna give you the opportunity going down the line here. Is there anything that you feel that we did not cover that you would like to speak about? Um, main thing that I would like to say is that we hear Every one of these panels, this is panel number five out of, out of, it's been about a year that we've been doing these. And every single panel, we have people come up that say, I went to see five different doctors and they all said that they really couldn't do anything for me. Or your incontinence is in your head. Your pelvic pain is in your head. All of that sort of stuff. If anybody ever says that to you, get a second opinion, okay? If you truly have a concern about something, it's not in your head. Somebody needs to address it. And if you don't know where to go and it's a sexual issue, Patty can help you out with our, our website. And you know, we, can always, we can always discuss like who, who might be the most appropriate person for you to go to for your particular issue. I want the take home message to be that things are definitely changing. For the first time ever last year at the oncology meeting, they actually addressed sexual health. And they talked about things like vaginal dryness and low libido and actually we recommended Addy. So our voices are finally being heard. But if we want to change the statistics, the 26 to two, or there's another one that was just published in Forbes magazine, 2% of all healthcare funding and research is currently spent on the prostate gland, okay? I guarantee you women, you don't have one. Um, <laughs> head to, no. Just head to toe for women, breast, ovaries, skin, cardiac, lungs, everything, 4%. 4%. So that's disturbing to me as a physician and as a researcher and as an advocate. And how am I going to change things? It's if you all voice your opinions, because if you come forward, and we continue to have nights like this where you're present and Patty continues to do groundbreaking things like having these speaker series and making this okay, we're gonna even those numbers. And I'm no longer gonna do interviews about gender disparity and we're gonna be finally talking about gender, gender equality when it comes to women's sexual health care. Yes? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Patty also for inviting me. Um, I didn't mention it, but I did my training here in Cincinnati, and I'm staying with my, my lovely sister, and I've had a wonderful week here. Um, and when I was talking to her about this last question, I really wanted to get out the message about female sexual anatomy, which, just like Dr. V mentioned, um, even the textbooks didn't even have the clitoris up until a couple decades ago. So I just wanted to talk just a few moments about that, which is the most amazing organ, okay, ever invented, right? Um, right? I got a little whoops, whoops. Um, so um, the clitoris, the only reason to have a clitoris is for sexual pleasure. That is the only reason. So for males, right, the penis, it serves a couple of functions, right? It's for urination, it's also for, for sex, but the clitoris really is only for sexual pleasure. That is its only reason. So use it, embrace it. Um, and I wanted to just give a, a quick little trivia because I love this fun fact. Um, so you know, we talked about the vulva, which is the external part. Um, so the clitoris is in that vulva, okay? And all you really see is the tip of the iceberg, right? Does anyone, not my sister because she knows the answer, does anyone know the full length of the clitoris from tip to tip? Can anyone? Inches, wow, I'm impressed. Go girl, no, it's not quite that big. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. But, but if you use a different thing at the end, you're really close. Anyone else? The total length of the clitoris. From what you can see, it also goes internal. What's that? Four inches? Quarter. A quarter inch, a little bigger. Okay, very close. So eight, eight to ten centimeters. So um, that's about three to four inches, which actually is like, wow, that's actually like pretty impressive. So um, just to just really quickly touch on the anatomy. So what you see is the glands, which is similar to the male glands, um, and then you have a body which is hidden by the hood. Okay, and then it goes back and dives down into bilateral cura, which wrap back to your sits bones where you sit on. So when people talk about G spots and things like that. You know, it's like, what is the G spot? Um, it's the internal part of the clitoris. So on the anterior, so the top side of the vagina, just a little, a couple of fingers, one or so little fingers inside, is where it sits and then and bifurcates. Um, so that's why some women feel a lot of stimulation internally, a lot of women feel stimulation externally, put them together, it feels really great. But some women have a preference for internal and external um, stimulation. So I just wanted to leave you with the fact that the clitoris is awesome, so is the brain. You need both of them working together for great, great sex. Love but that. Um, just wanted to leave you with a little anatomy. Did lesson. you feel better? You're, you're really yeah. learning a lot. Yeah. I'm taking her next time I go to the FDA. I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> you should. <laughs> Um, I guess the thing that I would mention is that we all represent different disciplines and they all work really well together. So, you know, just because you're getting one treatment doesn't mean that you're going to ben not benefit from what everyone else has to offer. So I treat patients before and after prolapse repair and I see patients while they're going through the laser treatments as well as, you know, there's only a limit as far as muscle function. They might need a little bit more and that's where Emma is a great resource. So, you know, it's it's beneficial to take a look at all these different disciplines together. It's not necessarily just one or just the other. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Patty. For those of you who don't know Patty's story, I think you should explore it. It's a, it's a fantastic story. And also the Patty Brisbane Foundation for bringing this topic to light and keeping it in the forefront because so many times, so many organizations try to suppress it and suppress it. And there are people and women that are having issues that are looking for help. And as you can see with this panel here, and this is just a minority of the skilled physicians that we have in this area to deal with these things. So my take home message would be if you have a problem and you're concerned about it and you see your physician or whoever your caregiver is, don't take no for an answer. Don't take no for an answer. Seek a second opinion, a third opinion. There may not be a quick solution, but there is a solution. And if you find the right person to work with you or the group of people to work with you, you can usually come up with a solution that will, will help you in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
Thank you for allowing me to be part of the panel. I am uh, uh, honored as a former board member. I can tell you that the Patty Brisbane Foundation does a lot of wonderful things and funds a lot of wonderful research. Uh, the University of Cincinnati has been lucky to be funded by the foundation as well uh, for some research and we've been able to generate some good data uh, that's out there. Uh, you know, there are uh, pluses and minuses to a, a number of things. You get a lot of misinformation. The internet is probably gives you some of the best and a lot of the worst things that are out there as far as information is concerned. So you have to be very careful. So being able to talk and listen to evidence-based information as you're listening to tonight is very, very important. Being able to go to the foundation website uh, is very important because that's where you're also going to get very good evidence-based information, <coughs> not just people trying to sell you things to make money that don't that doesn't work uh, to make sure that you're getting the best information and the best uh, uh, products uh, available but uh, uh, I think that panels like this are very important panels like uh, that have uh, taken place through uh, the foundation are very important because uh, the, the women in this community are very lucky to have a Patty Brisbane and we're very lucky uh, to be able to come together and let you all know what we think and to give you our information and we are appreciative of you being here. Thank you. And I didn't pay these people. I swear I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Emma. So one of the things that um, Dr. Javade loves to say, and I love her saying this, is that your brain is your biggest sex organ, right? And so one thing that I think is really important as you um, start to age is the idea, and now, um, like wherever you are in your life, the low libido piece. And um, I think there's been the societal idea that if your partner comes to you and says, hey, do you want to have sex, and you're not feeling it in that moment, that you automatically start to feel like, oh, I must have low libido. But actually, we all feel desire in different ways. So if I can understand the way that I feel desire, now there's a hormonal piece to it, but I think personally as a sex therapist, that there's a connection that if you're connected to your partner, whether you are um, deficient in your hormone or not, that the um, cognitive piece of you connecting actually has a desire component to it. So if you can start to understand how do I actually experience desire and how that might be different than my partner. So two of them are spontaneous desire and responsive desire. So if I come and I say, oh, my partner is looking really nice right now, I could go have sex now like let's go that is spontaneous desire like I'm spontaneously attracted and feeling aroused by my partner having desire so desire is that I want to have sex arousal is my body is feeling that sexual energy if I have responsive desire it might mean that I need something to respond in my environment to feel that desire so it might mean that like I need to have a conversation first and feel connected or a bubble bath or affirmation or I might need a lot of foreplay um, before, we, before I'm able to get to another uh, degree of sexual experience. So being able to understand that I have desire but other things need to happen first before I start to feel that desire is okay. It might just look different than your partner and that doesn't mean you have low desire. So just understanding that even if you have a low um, hormones, uh, you could still connect in a way that still increases your desire and your libido for that, uh, um, for you to have that sexual experience. Thank you. All right. So this is the time where you get to come up here and ask the experts. There's a mic here and a mic here. So who wants to be brave and step up? All right. Right. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. So much information. Love these notebooks. Thank you. Full, full. Um, so I had a client message me today and said that she had vulva cancer, which is the first time that I've ever heard of that, um, and that she was having a vulvaectomy. And I didn't know, first of all, what to, I mean, I'm going to sit down and have coffee with her and just kind of listen to her experience. But is that something that, um, is there like a surgical procedure afterwards to, make her feel more comfortable? Is there like plastic surgery for that? Would the laser treatment be something that she could do? I just, I don't even know like what information to offer her or what guidance to give her as far as like who to talk to. So, vulvectomy, I mean, 
Basically, vulvectomy just means removing part of the vulva. So like Dr. Fukuhara was saying, you know, the vulva is both the inner and the outer labia. Um, and depending on where the lesion is and how big it is, that depends on how much you have to remove. But basically, the whole point is to remove it down to the underlying layer of fascia. So fascia is the really strong stuff that holds everything together. So you have to remove all of the tissue down to that and get good margins. What that usually leaves is a little bit of a deformity. Okay, so one side's going to look normal, the other side's gonna look a little sunken, right? Sometimes you have to have other therapies afterwards, and sometimes you don't, depending on if they got everything that they thought they got. Do you have lymph nodes that are positive? All that kind of stuff. Um, so kind of have to wait and see a little bit um, with how she goes through everything. I mean, is it just excising things and then we're good to go? Um, there are things that we can do, though. So let's say she's completely finished with her therapy. She has this asymmetric vagina now and the vulva is, it, it, and she's uncomfortable about it. If she's not uncomfortable about it, that's fine. If her sexual function is still fine, that's fine. You know, if she feels very self-conscious about it, then that goes into where Dr. Vaccaro was talking about earlier, about the fact that cosmetics aren't always just, I want my labia to look pretty, okay? it's. I feel like I'm deformed now because I had this cancer surgery. And then that is where the real medical benefit comes in to having surgery to be able to even it out. You can use flaps, um, which basically like you take a, a little piece of fat from one side, you move it to the other, you even things out, so. I have used the laser to reduce scar tissue. I've had women who've had surgery and they have things that are tucked up or kind of like a curtain where they shouldn't be. Um, so I've done that. Uh, but I always tell my patients to get at least two opinions. And uh, it's a different approach. I mean, vulvar cancer is very unique and it does completely depend on the size and location of the, the lesion and how much they're gonna take and what's involved with the entire treatment. Is it just surgery or there is some other medication that's gonna be involved? Um, and getting at least two opinions. Is it pretty rare, or is it? It's, it's definitely a lot more rare than the other gynecologic cancers we were talking about tonight. So, um, and it's mostly HPV related, so same as, same as cervical, okay. so. Okay. And it has different uh, uh, layers. It has like vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia, one, two, three, before it gets precancerous and then cancerous. So, you know, if she's having, and then there's a simple vulvectomy and a radical vulvectomy, mm -hmm. depending on how advanced it is. So um, it, it really depends on, on the type of cancer that she has, how deep it is, and where it's located, which is what they were talking about. Yeah. So definitely recommending her to get another opinion and maybe talk with some more professionals. It's always good, I mean, in oh, general. Yes. I think I, yeah. everybody always says to me, like, they'll come in and they'll be like, I just want you to know, I went to go see so-and-so across town to get a second opinion, and he said the same thing you did. You know, so, and I'm always like, yeah. well, good, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, because, you know, it's validating for me too, right? Like, I'm telling you something <laughs> that's actually valid. Um, but it's always, always, always a good idea to get a second opinion if you have any sort of hesitancy about what's being recommended to you. We should, we're not going to get offended with that, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. The microphone is open. Don't be shy. Okay, you, you can lean, you can go behind her. Yeah. Okay, okay, all right. So I have a question regarding. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Pelvic floor exercise and the laser, is it, do they go hand in hand? Do, they, do you recommend doing one first before the other? Because as you said, the Kardashian vaginal re rejuvenation, we're gonna start to hear a lot of that out in the field now. Like, what do you guys think about that? That's what they're gonna ask us out there. I, I think they do different things. And I definitely work with pelvic floor just as much as I work with counselors because they were talking about working with the muscular layer. And any doctor that tells you the laser penetrates that deeply is not telling you the correct thing, and that's why some of the laser companies got in trouble with their claims. Um, so I think you're addressing different things. The laser works superficially on the mucosa, and just like Dr. Cram alluded to, works on collagen, elastin, blood flow, um, not really gonna work on muscle tone. Um, and that's where you know pelvic floor physical therapy comes in. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, some women are coming in saying the vaginal opening is too tight and it can't accommodate their erect 
uh, partner, especially with 26 medications. Um, and <laughs> other patients are like, Dr. Duran, I'm like a cave and I have no tone. And so it, you can't just give an end all be all, but definitely I have tons of patients that do both. And then remember I alluded to that study that some of them also need medication um, because they get even better results. So it really depends on the patient and that's why you need a really good gynecologic exam. You just can't go to a pop-up hormone shop and um, Patty knows I'm opinionated and she'll put me up here, but you, you've got to go to someone you trust and someone who knows what they're doing with their exam. That's why I put you up there because <laughs> I don't want a bunch of yes people up here. You have to remember also that if somebody's suffering with painful intercourse for a long period yeah. of time and they haven't addressed it, over time their body and their muscles will compensate and they will always tighten up. And so over time, they'll have the, their levator muscles, which is the main muscle of the pelvic floor, get so tight that they get something called levator myalgia, where those muscles, they should be loose, just like any other muscle, but you touch them and they're so tight and they cause pain. So in that situation, when you're using the laser to treat the vaginal mucosa, you also would use physical therapy to help train or teach the patient to relax those muscles so they can work in conjunction. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Sometimes, though, the uh, use of uh, small dilators and increasing dilators and, uh, uh, are very helpful. We actually use dilators. Sometimes women are born without a vagina, and we have to create a vagina uh, uh, prior to any type of surgical considerations. Uh, but we actually point our patients to the uh, Pure Romance site, and we use the uh, dilators from that side. We used to have a guy in Rochester who would make them in his garage. That was not probably the best thing. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but we, now, we now direct our patients elsewhere uh, to, the, to the Pure Romance site. But I, I think that, you, you know, you, that a lot of things have to be done in order to uh, get the uh, uh, vaginal mucosa back up to a normal state. That's guys, why a lot of them were like six hundred dollars, you right. know, because they were exactly. being made in a little garage. Right. Exactly. You guys look, you should look at the competition. Those of you guys who work for Patty Brisbane and see what some of the patients are bringing in, what they've been using, they look like candlesticks. Okay. I mean, they look prehistoric, um, like torture devices, and we're like, yep, yeah, we're not going to use that. <laughs> and the other good thing about the, the Pure Romance one, so first of all, they're a half to a third of the cost of the ones that you're going to get ordered through your doctor's office, yeah. So, and they're exactly the same quality. They come in several different sizes, and they're color-coded, so they don't look like candle six, um, you know, and they're soft and flexible, right. so you know they're they're not uncomfortable to use. So and they have a handle, and they have a handle, which yeah. my patients love. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And to um, talk about what you're saying, like um, that's where this biopsychosocial piece is so important because if you're using the laser, like what you guys were saying, if you're using the laser, um, but this person's having pain and there's tightening of the muscles, then you need to be able to use the pelvic floor therapy, but there's a, there's a fear that happens where they need to get over the fear, like work through that fear, which is where like sex therapy comes into play. So us creating that team approach is so vital for them to get the best care going forward. But it's tough too, because they're going from doctor to doctor to doctor, right? So there's this, it can be tough, but um, I think that's where us collectively is, it's a great team. I think so too. All right. My question is on the edge of sexual health, but as an aging woman, um, I'm having hair loss. So I suspect that it's hormonally based, but I just like to know kind of what the root cause is, and I know if you knew the answer, you would be using it. But that was meant to be a, jo a friendly joke. <laughs> So, I guess my question is directed to you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I used to have I, I used like to have more hair. hair. Oh, I'm thank sure you, not. thank you. Um, you know what happens as a, a woman ages? The, a uh, you go from an estrogen state uh, where the ovaries are making estrogen, as, as was alluded to. You continue to make estrogen uh, even after the menopause, and there's estrogen that's even made in the fat. Uh, but the ovaries also produce male hormones, androgens. So as you go through the menopausal state, that balance shifts slightly over time. 
uh, uh, and by when that shift takes place, the est ovaries are still making hormones, uh, but they go from probably being a predominant estrogen-making organ to potentially a more dominant uh, male hormone-producing organ. And you're also making male hormones in the adrenal gland. You're making uh, male hormones uh, in the uh, remaining uh, ovaries, and they're left behind. So because of that, sometimes you start to get an increase in midline hair growth. Sex-dependent hair growth is midline, so above the lip, below the chin, between the breast, between the belly button, and the pubic bone area. You start to see those hairs start to thicken and become coarser over time as you get that hormonal shift. Uh, sometimes the use of estrogen can correct that balance. Sometimes there's some people who have conditions like, say, polycystic ovary syndrome, even when they are of a reproductive age before they go into the menopause, and they can have more midline hair growth. But with the menopause, you start, you do start to see that shift in uh, a more estrogen dominant to a more estrogen, androgen, or male hormone dominant state, and that's why that can. Uh, that can take place. Generally not the loss of my beautiful blonde locks as I used to have many years ago. Uh, but uh, uh, but, but uh, you do start to notice a change over time and that's normal. Uh, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, the use of estrogens can help. Sometimes, but that's not really the reason that you take estrogens. Uh, but sometimes there are other uh, things that can be given. We sometimes will use things like aldactone or spironolactone because it helps to block the male hormone receptors in the skin. Uh, uh, that may or may not help, uh, but uh, uh, those it's, it's a natural process that are causing some of those types of problems or concerns. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else with a question? Yes. Yeah, I've got a question about how things connect and how they work. There's an emotional thing, there's an electronic thing, there's a chemical thing, and when you're having all your estrogen and your progesterone blocked, the, the comment that was made to me is there's still a switch there. I guess there's several switches, mm -hmm. but there's no wiring to connect it. How do you overcome that, that mentality, that, that type of problem? Whoever knows about that. It's a multi-directional <laughs> approach. Right. So it's, it's, sometimes it's medications. Um, because we talk, you know, low libido for women is not just hormones. Sometimes they're, I check their testosterone and it's normal. Sometimes it's like the new medication I talked about, neurotransmitters in the brain. Or I had a patient who had zero libido. I gave her all these medications, couldn't fix anything. Six months later, she's like, oh, my libido's great. My orgasm's off the hook. I go, what happened? Dr. Javain, I got divorced. So, she, I mean, right? So here I am going, I did it, right? So. I'm not going to fix that problem. I'm not going to give you libido directed at a partner. So that's where you know this multi-directional approach comes in. Or if they have problems with muscle tone. So it's. I wish I could give you a end-all, be-all, just one answer. But you have I didn't to expect a one answer. One answer. This is so you got to address yeah. everything. So a women, women's sexual health. You got to think about the inside of a cockpit, yes. and that's what it looks yeah. like. And right. so you've got to figure out all the wiring by addressing everything. And someone who just tells you, gives you one pill and says, oh, here's Addie, she's gonna be fine, mm -hmm. has given you car keys, but no car, okay? Like, you can't drive it. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to go to someone that has this connection that can work with a group of physicians and individuals who can treat the entire patient. So the emotional isolation, you know, patients, like I said, they feel broken. So the emotional, mm -hmm. the biochemical can be fixed with hormones and medications. Surgical, we've addressed physical therapy. So it is truly a group approach. And it's awesome that you're asking the question, and I encourage you to go with your partner and talk about sexual health with all of these providers here, <laughs> and make sure you bring a list and ask everything, because sometimes, I'm not gonna say always, but providers don't ask, how's your sex? Almost never, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually did a lovely study about when people start talking, how quickly providers interrupt them. So try, <laughs> just, <laughs> just know that we, we have, we're type A, and we like, to, we like to keep moving, but we do wanna help you, so just please come with a list. If your provider doesn't talk about sex and it's important to you, bring it up, ask the questions, and if they don't wanna talk about it, get a second opinion and keep asking because there's a lot of knowledge and education out there, but sometimes providers aren't comfortable because their training wasn't, um, they don't feel they were adequate. Even OBGYNs, which a lot of us are, don't get a lot of training in sexual health, sadly. So 
keep going and keep looking so you find people like this that are willing and open to talk about it because it is one of the most important quality of life issues there is. Well, don't forget when you're talking about drive, that's not just sex drive, that's drive, period. So it's, it interferes with more drives than one. Correct. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, it, it, so if, if you have a quality of life problem that is sexually related, it can affect other aspects of your life, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Anybody else that's. Thank you. I think that's a really important piece too that you were saying about get your partner to come with you. Whenever I sit with clients, like I'll have a, either a female or a male come in and say, I'm the problem, like I'm the broken one. And they're going to these appointments by themselves and I'll ask like, well, would you want your partner to come with you? And they're like, yeah, I would. And I'll ask the partner, are you comfortable going with them? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. And there's something about that that makes it feel more supportive and like, we're doing this together. This is a team approach, not that I'm the problem and I have to go get my stuff fixed. So when they go to the physical therapy or they go to the gynecology appointments, um, there's something there where it feels like we're doing this together and the partner's able to understand from the doctor's point of view too. Like, oh, okay, I see what's going on. I see what this person's having to go through that, um, that creates a connection and a bond too. That's really important. I just had a quick question. I don't know if this is an old wives tale, but now that I'm having hot flashes, I love my coffee. Do I need to give up coffee because the caffeine, you know, makes menopause worse? I mean, I don't know if that's a old wives tale. I didn't know if any of you all knew. Uh, sometimes hot things can uh, make uh, uh, some menopausal symptoms worse, but you know, not all the time, but you know, it depends on the person. I mean, there are a number of things over the counter that work for hot flashes, uh, but sometimes hot beverages can cause an increase in hot flashes. That's been shown uh, in the past, but not in everyone. Uh, not necessarily the caffeine, just the fact that it's a hot beverage. And sometimes, you know, I think there have been some studies to show that caffeine may have an effect on hot flashes. There are, some, there are a number of different uh, substances out there that can cause uh, issues with uh, increase in hot flashes. Uh, being in a cold room, a cool room also helps. Being in a room without a lights, but it's hard to live that way unless uh, you're an <laughs> IT person, I guess, or or a radiologist. Uh, but um, uh, the I think the best thing to do is uh, to know that uh, most women, if they tr do nothing, will get through that phase. But there are over-the-counter things that some people start out with, like black cohosh, uh, 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 things over-the-counter like that. That that. Uh, at, from an evidence-based standpoint don't seem to work. There are the medical treatments, whether it's estrogen-based or non-estrogen-based or uh, the, SSS, the SSRs, RIs, which are uh, uh, more for anti-depression type symptoms, but there are some things that we do that, that can increase hot flashes and there are some things you can do like exercise and all of those types of uh, physical activities that actually may decrease hot flashes. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm 41 years old and I hate talking in public, but I just want to say something. Um, like over the past year, I've noticed like every month, like I'm wondering, am I going to start menopause? Like I, it's like this weird irrational anxiety that I have, but it's, it can happen. And so um, just after listening to you all speak, I feel like it's nothing to like be ashamed of or to fear. And like, I just like appreciate you guys speaking to us tonight. Like I feel like next month I'm not going to be so anxious and you know so thank you. Thank you. So since we were talking hot flashes I understand night sweats are a thing as well. <laughs> not not overheating just all of a sudden like man I need my covers still on but I am now sweating through and apparently they even provide clothing that allegedly wicks it away etc but in particular, I am wondering, a friend of mine had said that her doctor had prescribed, I think an SSRI, but certainly a, a, some medication that actually assisted with that, and I was curious if that's, if yeah. that's a thing. Yeah. That, that is a normal treatment. Matter of fact, probably gynecologists prescribe more Prozac, Paxil, those types of things than, than most other doctors out there for, for those reasons as well as others. Um, the premenopause can start any time over the age of 35. 
the postmenopause, where you stop periods altogether, can start any time over the age of 40. And then there's that gap between, you know, when do you know when that's starting? And the premenopause can start where the cycles can start to become closer together before they start to lengthen apart. The premenopause can start uh, with just very subtle things, uh, whether it's slight memory loss because of the decrease in estrogen in the brain, to night sweats, to uh, uh, later hot flashes, later possibly vaginal dryness. But just subtle changes can occur with disruption of the menstrual cycle, as was discussed earlier today. Estrogen levels and FSH levels, hormone levels, can just start to become very tumultuous and come all over the, and go all over the place before they start to drift away. I think we know the least about that time frame from the age of 35 to the age of the average age 50 to 51 when the menopause occurs in most people. But there's that time frame where subtle things take place, then the subtle things become less subtle, the menstrual changes become less predictable, uh, and that's when people start to slowly notice uh, that those changes can occur. The average age that you will have of menopause generally is about the same as your mother or your older sister. Uh, most families from a genetic standpoint have uh, changes uh, from the menopause when that time is going to stop uh, 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 that correlates with their uh, older siblings or their uh, uh, older female family members, particularly the mothers and sisters. So uh, things can be subtle. It's hard to tell exactly uh, what may be going on. Uh, talking to a, a physician and going on the appropriate treatment would be the best thing. Just one thing about SSRIs, though, remember, since we're talking about sexual health here, one of the side effects of the SSRIs is a decrease in libido or de decrease in sex drive. So if you're going to your physician to seek help for hot flashes, and that is some, an underlying issue that you didn't bring up to them, you want to make sure you let them know because there are some that have less of that side effect than others. Yes, yeah. SSRIs. Yeah. So yeah, you have to be mind. Yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> the big O. It finally came up. You have to be mindful of the uh, orgasm. <laughs> I told you, Patty. That's why she puts me up here. Yeah. Um, so so let's get back to hormones just for a minute because at the very beginning, everyone had a card. Are hormones generally safe? The answer is yes. So just a quick history lesson. So before 2003, when the WHI that Dr. Thomas talked about. The study that came out um, that kind of changed how we practice. Before that, every woman went on hormones at menopause for heart prevention, osteoporosis, mental health, not feeling quote unquote crazy, okay, all those reasons, okay, memory loss, et cetera. Every woman was put on hormones. And guess what? Almost every woman felt really good on hormones and they, were, they kept on them forever, okay? Um, and then the study came out that was mainly for um, older women. So they put women mostly in their 60s, 70s that already had gone through menopause on hormones. And that's not the, not the patients that we're going to see, not the patients we're going to treat. The patients that we're going to treat are in their 50s, usually 40s to 50s, that are going through menopause. You put a woman like that on hormones and they do really well. And they are really happy and things work really well. So if you think about this much as what your body's making and you go through menopause, we're going to give you back this much so you don't feel miserable. So it's not like we're replacing all the hormones. We're just replacing enough so you don't have hot flashes, night sweats, bone loss, memory loss, et cetera. So if you're someone who's like, you know what, I want to treat the root of the problem, ask your doctor for hormones and don't be afraid about it. And if the doctor says, no, I won't do it for X, Y, and Z, go to another doctor. Right. Um, because just like we've talked about, sometimes SSRIs aren't always the best treatment if you're thinking about sexual health. I think that one of the things that we always have to, uh, and I, I'm an examiner on the boards, and, and, and uh, one of the things I always ask is, uh, ask a physician is what type of hormones do you use if you use hormones, and they, they tell you. And then they talk about equivalent doses. The amount of estrogen in a menopausal dose of uh, hormone is basically equivalent to one-fourth to one-seventh of the dose of a birth control pill. Birth control pills are sort of what people think of when they think of hormones, but the amount you give of, of estrogen in the, uh, uh, a pill that we use for menopausal symptoms is about one-seventh the amount that you see in the standard dose of birth control pills that are given. So we're, not talk we're talking about giving hormone levels that are less than the uh, level of hormones you were making at age 30, just enough 
to maintain function, decrease hot flashes. So I, I think that's the sort of disconnect by, by making hormones bad, making hormones sound like you take one pill, you're going to develop a cancer, is not a good thing. And if you look at the WHI, uh, the women who took just estrogen alone, who didn't have a uterus, had a lower risk of breast cancer than the women who were not taking hormones. So they're not bad things, as she, as she said. Uh, hormones, Primarin was on the Time magazine uh, back in the uh, 70s, as the wonder drug back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so uh, hormones uh, aren't the thing aren't the bad things that most physicians uh, may think they are because of the Women's Health Initiative and having discussions, frank discussions like this. SSRIs aren't the, the answer. For some patients, they may be helpful, but they do have side effects. Estrogen, along with a small dose <coughs> of progesterone and even a spaced out dose of progesterone, or even we talked about earlier today, some people have put in like a Mirena IUD to protect the uterus, and you can take estrogen uh, for uh, as long as you have that Mirena IUD in. So there are a number of different ways of protecting the uterus, a number of different ways of taking hormones that are safe and that, uh, along with seeing your clinician on a regular basis to make sure that you aren't having any other potential side effects. And some of the vaginal hormones that we talked about have even less systemic side effects. So even less is getting into your bloodstream. So that's why a lot of the oncologists are okay with some of the vaginal hormones so that you don't have to live with painful sex or vaginal dryness. Um, it's very, very uncomfortable for a lot of the patients to, to live that way and they think that they have to and all they have to do is ask one more question. So when I'm out there talking to physicians, you know, I advocate for you guys to ask because no one's going to give it to you unless you ask. But I also tell the providers, they say, we're so busy, we don't have time to, you know, treat sexual health. I'm like, take the time to ask one more question. Ask your patient about sexual health. It's vital to quality of life. And just to tag on, it's okay if your physician says, this is a really important quality of life problem and I want you to schedule a follow-up just to talk about that because honestly you're gonna get a small little bit if you ask it right at the end if you came for lots of reasons but if you came if you come just specifically to talk about that you're gonna get a lot of information if you came for lots of reasons that was like the last thing ask if you can schedule a follow-up just to talk just about that because it really does deserve a whole entire visit to really get to the biologic social emotional physical aspects that can be contributing to um, whatever concern there is Thank you. I just wanted to say that I am actually um, a breast cancer survivor, just recently actually. 100% ERPR positive lobular carcinoma. So um, I feel like I've been told multiple times that I can't take hormones. My mom took them for years. Um, no history in my family, genetic testing, the whole thing. Um, I could probably come see every one of you for some reason, so <laughs> it's very complicated. Um, but I just wanted to thank you and uh, for the encouragement that you're talking to. I'm sure there are other breast cancer survivors in the room. Um, and if there aren't, um, which the odds are that there's somebody, um, just take that information and use it because it could happen, you know, one in eight's a big number. Um, so thank you for preparing some of these people to know those things, and it's okay. Um, my question tonight is actually for Dr. Vigaro. I wanted to understand a little bit more about prolapse because my mother has that. And I wanted to know, is it genetic? And is this something that I can prepare for and try to avoid? And I have a sister as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank um, you. There, um, there are some genetic components, um, specific kind of rare conditions of collagen elastin disorders like Marfan's, which are kind of pretty rare. But we do know through looking at twin data that there, is, there are some genetic links. So yes, there are some genetic components. Um, the biggest risk factor we talked about is childbirth, so vaginal childbirth, especially with a large tear. Um, those have the highest risk factor. And then the lifestyle issues. So again, if you're like, you know, crazy with the CrossFit and crazy with the weight training and not that you can't protect the pelvic floor, but over time, even no matter the strongest squeeze ever, you're gonna have a little bit of wear and tear on the ligaments that support the vagina. Um, so be cautious of heavy lifting without supporting the pelvic floor first. And then constipation like we talked about. So um, I, I should 
have some royalties for this device. But anyways, there's a device called the Squatty Potty. If you haven't heard about it, please look it up tonight, okay? Um, I have a bejeweled one in my office. I just love the thing. So, um, <laughs> so if, if you ever feel like you're constipated, feel like you need to strain, or just you just want to be preventative, it's a device that gets you in the proper alignment to empty your bowel and bladder um, so your pelvic floor is not working against you, so to speak. Um, so anything you can do to, to relieve straining on the ligaments uh, that support the vagina will be protective. And if I could add in just a little bit about that as well. Um, so Squatty Potty definitely, <laughs> we have one in every bathroom in our <laughs> office um, because I decided I was like, well, the hospital won't buy it, so I'm going to buy them. So, um, but the main thing about prolapse that you have to know is that it sounds awful and you're going to, you know, if you ever have experienced it, it's like one day you, you wake up and you're like, oh, it's my cervix. Okay, well, now what do I do, right? Um, it is one of those things that it is not life-threatening, okay? It's not gonna kill you. It's just really uncomfortable and annoying. And when people ask, well, how bad does prolapse have to be before I do something about it? The answer is when it bothers you enough to do something about it. Um, we have lots of surgical opportunities for that. We have conservative therapies like um, pessaries and, and things like that. And then physical therapy, if your prolapse isn't that bad, you can usually take care of your symptoms with physical therapy as well. So it's not something to be afraid of. It happens in about 12% of women need surgery for prolapse. So it's very, very common. We're going to take one more question. Hi. Um, I was told by both my primary care physician and my gynecologist that would, um, they would not recommend doing the hormone therapies because even after you take hormones, when you're taken off of them, you go back through the hot flashes again. Is that correct? Yes. That any time you, you start hormones, if you're not making estrogens uh, uh, on your own or hormones on your own, you will start to go back into the same state. So if you're gonna take hormones, and uh, you should be followed with your physician on a regular basis, usually once a year, uh, to before you get the next uh, prescription. But if you do stop them, uh, some people talk about the fact that you can only take them for X number of years. I have I've had patients on uh, hormones for more than 20 years plus if, if we start them right either during the transition from the premenopause through the menopause uh, or at when they initially start the menopause. Uh, but if you stop estrogens, you will start to not have that hormone in your system anymore because remember, you're art being given hormones artificially, but once you stop taking them, you will start to go back into uh, a uh, non-estrogen state, which could include then starting to have the hot flashes. So, so there's, you don't not start them because you may have them if you stop them, you start them because you need them and you want to prevent those types of symptoms and being on them for a prolonged period of time safely uh, to help protect bone, uh, to help decrease hot flashes, to help to decrease some of the uh, uh, vaginal dryness and urinal uh, pelvic floor issues uh, and as we talked about before, there are estrogen receptors in the skin so there are other uh, benefits uh, to the use of estrogens but to not take them because you may stop them one day, that's probably the wrong way of looking at it. You take them because you want to use it and you want to still uh, want to feel as young as you feel today. Thank you, I appreciate having a, a clear answer on that. <laughs> and, and be your own advocate. Again, and if, if a doctor says, I'm not gonna prescribe them because it's an X number of times, say, no, I really feel good on these and I don't feel good off these and it's my quality of life. And again, it's a partnership. You know, We're in a partnership with you, the patient, we educate you and provide you with information. But you have to be the one saying, no, I really, I really want this. I'm willing to take the X, Y, and Z risks that you told me about, and I, I want this. So don't be afraid to be your own advocate and advocate for yourself. Right now, I want every single one of you in this room to give this amazing panel of doctors a big round. Thank you for your time and your contribution to sexual health. Thank you. Um, now let me tell you, there's a couple things I need from the audience here tonight. Number one, if you didn't get your question answered or you didn't feel that you could step up to the mic, please go to the pattybrisbanefoundation.org, submit your question, and I can tell you one, one or many of these experts will um, give us 
the um, answer. We will put it up in about two weeks on our website. Another thing I'm going to ask for, we're, we're constantly wanting to know where is it and what can we do better. So if you have a subject that you want to talk about regarding sexual health, if you want to tell us how we can improve, we want to hear that as well. I want you to also get your phones out right now. Get them out, get them out, get them out. Um, our next Sexual Health Matters will be Tuesday, November 12th. Again, you can go to the pattybrisbanefoundation.org for the location. Um, our topic on our Sexual Health Matters will be sexual trauma. So that will be our next one. Right now, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out here tonight. Uh, I hope that, again, and this might not have been about you, but I hope that you take the information that you've gotten here tonight and you pay it forward to someone else. Um, I appreciate every single one of you. Please be safe and going home. The doctors are going to be here for a little bit of time. They have to get up because they have surgeries in the morning. But I'm sure if you have questions, they will stay an extra five, 10 minutes. Am I right? Can I have you guys? Um, so again, thank you very much. Thank you.